So we've talked about the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, that's our local home. That's, that's, that's the, the collection of things that make up our own galaxy. And we've talked about the local group. That's the little group of galaxies the Milky Way belongs to. And so, uh, uh, so we've already introduced the idea about what are galaxies and what are, what, what, how they are structured in terms of groups. So our, our next topic uh, here to study is kind of big picture, you know, going, looking beyond just the Milky Way. And so looking at other galaxies. So here's a picture of the Andromeda Galaxy. It used to be called the Great Spiral Nebula Andromeda. We talked about the history of this, how they used to think this was a cloud of gas swirling together to make a star, until Edwin Hubble discovered, oh, no, wait, it's an entire galaxy. Uh, our galaxy, again, seen from the inside. You've seen this picture before. Okay. We talked about the Curtis Shapley debate early part of the 20th century in which they made these arguments about, you know, what are these spiral nebulae. Herbert Curtis actually was the one pushing the idea that they are things like the Milky Way. Island Universes is the name that he used to describe this. And Harlow Shapley arguing that the uh, Milky Way really is the entire universe. Um, and, and, and how the argument was really settled by uh, Edward when Hubble discovered a way of measuring the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. Okay. So the way we measure distance to the galaxies, uh, the nearby galaxies, is with Cepheid variables uh, uh, in the galaxy, and that lets us find the distance. Uh, so here we have a very pretty galaxy, a nice spiral galaxy, grand design spiral. Uh, this spiral galaxy is M81, and it's about 12 million light years away. Now, when you talk about n distances like that, millions of light years, humans really have a tough time co conceptualizing a million. So, um, again, in astronomy, we often talk about parsecs. So 12 million light years is about 3,700,000 parsecs. Well, that's still a pretty big number. So divide by 1,000 to get kiloparsecs, or divide that by a million to get megaparsecs. So, so a megaparsec is parsecs divided by a million. And so it's 3.68 megaparsecs. Now, 3.68, that's a number you can grasp. And it's a little over three and two-thirds. You have an idea what three and two-thirds looks like. So we often talk about distances to galaxies in megaparsecs. Size of a galaxy, we often talk about in kiloparsecs. And then distance to nearby stars is either parsecs or light years. Well, if all Hubble did was measure the distance to, uh, uh, or rather, uh, figure out what the Andromeda galaxy is, what galaxies were, that would have made him famous. He did more than that. He also figured out a way of classifying galaxies, the Hubble classification system, which we still use. That's also meant something to make him famous. But one other thing he did really made him famous. Remember, Vesto Slipher had realized that the uh, 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 galaxies or the spiral nebulae he was measuring were, for the most part, redshifted. Well, Hubble comes along here and he says, well, not just redshifted, let's measure how redshifted they are. And so what he did was he looked at a bunch of galaxies. He measured spectral lines in the galaxies, like the calcium H and K lines, and he noticed that for nearby galaxies, which looks pretty big, they're located in one spot. As the galaxies are farther away, then they're more and more redshifted. And so this gave rise to, the, to a relationship that he made a graph of how far galaxies were away from us and uh, compared with the redshift. So the farther away they are, the more redshifted they are. And so he made, in 1929, he made this graph. So the distance in megaparsecs is here. The recessional velocity in kilometers per second is here. And so there's a trend here. So you have these, 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 these dots all over the place here. But um, if you use a computer or even Excel to plot the best fit line through there, you notice there's a rough trend. Well, this actually indicates something. 
uh, that, that, that that there's a definite relationship here. Um, so he extended the, the date. So in 1931, he went and looked at things much, much farther away. And that trend he noticed in 1929 continues. Now, this was a major step forward because that means if you've got a galaxy out here and you were to look at the spectrum of the galaxy, you measure how redshifted it is, then we know that, that the velocity is the change in wavelength over the wavelength times the speed of light. So the redshift, in fact, this change in wavelength of the, over the, where the wavelength is supposed to be, we sometimes call Z. So the velocity is z times c. Uh, so z is the redshift. By measuring that redshift, the change in wavelength over the wavelength, multiplying it by the speed of light, then, then we can find the velocity. So on a graph like this, you would say, hey, there's this galaxy. It's so far away, I cannot see Cepheid variables in it, but I can measure the spectrum of the galaxy, find out how redshift it is, find out it's like redshifted like this, come over here, and it's that many uh, megaparsecs away from us. So this was a huge step forward. And so this relationship, now this is a graph. So you look at a graph like this and we know the formula for a graph is that the y equals for line mx plus b. Well b is zero because we're intercepting here. So that means the y is the velocity the uh, x is the, the distance, so that means that uh, there's a slope here. And the slope we call the Hubble constant. Well, if we do a little bit of algebra on that, then we see that d equals 1 over h times v. So that allows us to figure out from the velocity by dividing by the slope of this line. So all you got to do is find a bunch of galaxies you can figure the distance to, plot them, find the slope of the line, and then another galaxy you're having trouble with, you just figure out its velocity and divide by the slope of the line, and that would give the distance to the galaxy. Okay. The uh, um, current estimate of the Hubble constant from plotting a bunch of galaxies is very close to 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So all you have to do is, like I said, find the velocity of the galaxy using the the the, uh, uh, the recession uh, velocity from the uh, uh, Doppler shift divide by the slope of the line and that would give you the distance. Okay, now what does this mean? What's the implication of this relationship? And this is what really got Hubble famous because he realized that what's happening is that the universe is expanding. Imagine a bunch of galaxies that are about 100 megaparsecs away from each other. So galaxy A and C in this diagram would be 200 megaparsecs away. Galaxies A and D would be 300. So after a certain amount of time, everything's moved. So galaxies A and B are 150 megaparsecs away. They used to be 100, so they changed by 50. Galaxies A and B are now 300 away from each other. They used to be 200, now they're 100 more. Galaxies... Uh, a and D are 150 away from each other. They used to be 300. Uh, uh, so, or rather, they're, they're 450 now. They used to be so they're 150 more. So the farther away you are, the farther they've moved away from you in the same time. Well, speed is distance over time. So if that distance is bigger, the speed's bigger. So what this suggests is the universe is expanding away from everything's getting farther and farther away from each other. The idea that the universe is expanding actually led uh, Georges Lemaitre, uh, Monsignor Georges Lemaitre. He was actually uh, a science advisor for the Vatican and worked at the um, Vatican Observatory. And so he worked backwards and said, well, wait a minute. He had actually noticed the same sort of thing before, that, that um, there's a relationship between distance and recession. And so he proposed about the same time that Hubble was making his announcement that this happened, that maybe the universe started off, if you ran all this thing backwards, it's getting farther and farther away from each other. At one time in the past, it must have been all squeezed together. He came with the idea of what he calls a primordial atom that the universe exploded away from. Now, this is not what happened. We know this is not what happened. This was just his first idea.
2018, what's always been known, what your textbook calls the Hubble Law, the International Astronomical Union, which is an international organization of astronomers, renamed the Hubble Lemaitre Law in, in, to recognize that Lemaitre had come up with a similar relationship. Okay, so Hubble, Hubble Law or the Lemaitre Law. Now, the idea that everything started primarily Adam, uh, Sir Fred Hoyle said that's ridiculous. In fact, if it was all squeezed together that tightly, it would collapse into a black hole. And that'd be the end of the universe. There'd be no, no universe at all. And so he says the whole thing's like silly, like some big bang happened and blew the whole universe apart. So he originated this term big bang as a, a very derisive, derogatory term to describe Lemaitre's idea. Well, what turns out is that we'll talk about this later, but uh, using Einstein's equations, of relativity, what we discover is that space can stretch, and really what's happening is things are not blowing away from each other. Instead, space is expanding, and as space expands, all the galaxies are getting further away from each other. I like to liken this to raisin bread, because I like raisin bread. Um, you get raisin bread, and you, you make the dough, and you have raisins in it, and then you bake it, and the dough expands, and all the raisins get farther away from each other. Well, if you slice open the raisin bread, you don't have little tunnels here where the raisins move through the bread to get away from each other. What happened was the bread expanded, and the raisins were sitting still and went along for the ride. Turns out that we now have the mathematics to show that's what's happening in our universe. It's not that the galaxies are all moving away from each other. They're all sitting kind of close to still, but space between is expanding. It's stretching. And, and so things are getting farther away from each other. Uh, so there was no primordial atom blowing things away from each other. Uh, in fact, there's an entirely new explanation for how those happen. Now, unfortunately, they called that also the Big Bang. Okay. Now, we're going to be getting back to all this stuff later. Uh, but uh, to explain the whole thing, uh, to, to do the detail, we have to understand the Hubble constant. Okay, we really ought to call it the Hubble Lemaitre constant, but we still call it the Hubble constant. So to measure that, we have to figure out how to measure distance to the galaxies. Cepheid variables only allow us to measure distance to nearby galaxies. But one thing we notice is that as a galaxy rotates, one side of the galaxy is blue shifted, the other is red shifted. And so by measuring that rotation rate from the difference between the redshift and the blue shift, uh, we've discovered that for spiral galaxies, that the brighter the galaxy is, the faster it rotates, because the brighter the galaxy, the more mass it has. So if you measure the rotation rate of the galaxy, you know the absolute magnitude of the galaxy. And so the distance can be found from 10 raised to the apparent magnitude minus of absolute magnitude plus 5 over 5. We keep using that same equation again. This is called the Tully-Fisher relationship. And so you would look at a galaxy and measure it and, and figure out the Tully-Fisher relationship. That's actually data I did in graduate school, uh, uh, looking at the Teller-Fisher relationship for SA galaxies. Turns out different kinds of galaxies have different Teller-Fisher relationships. So the Teller-Fisher relationship allows you to measure distances to galaxies too far away to see individual Cepheids. We, which, that's, when you, that's when they discovered that type 1a supernovae are all the same brightness. So type 1a supernovae, you can look at the, one of those in a really far away galaxy, you know the absolute magnitude, the magnitude apparent magnitude, and that allows you to find distance to really far away galaxies, almost to the edge of the universe. And so uh, this, this builds sort of a distance pyramid in which we use radar to find distance to the planets to figure out what 1AU is, and then use parallax to figure out the distance near my new, near, nearby stars once we know what an AU is, and then main sequence fitting, uh, which we talked about in lab, to figure out distance to star clusters, and from that, Cepheid variables. So this is how we build up our way of measuring distances. And that gives us the Hubble relationship.